You are listening to part two of two of our conversation with Chris Bache. Now, Chris, you've mentioned um, this crisis or pivotal point for humanity, and what insights or experiences have you gained as, from that, from your psychedelic work, about this crisis or pivotal point, and what do you see as the evolutionary trajectory of humanity as a whole coming through that? Well, that is a big question, isn't it? Uh, That's a huge question, and it has absorbed a lot of my uh, time and in non-ordinary states of consciousness. It's been one of the recurring themes, and... uh, because what happens when you when your individual bubble of consciousness dissolves when the drop opens you you fall into the divine at different depths and uh one of the things that happens i think is that one falls into deep time uh so one falls out of linear time into the deeper expanse of time so the the universe seems to have many different time signatures and one can experience uh, arcs of time over thousands and thousands of years as if it were a simple hour and even hundreds of thousands of years and and so as I dissolved at the individual level I was drawn into repeatedly into the evolutionary uh, arc that underlies my individual existence. I was drawn into the arc of of human evolution as a whole, which is just, of course, one layer of the larger evolution of the planet and solar system and so on. And just as I was drawn into these large episodes of collective suffering, when I would spin out, when eventually these would peak and I would go through some large combustion death rebirth process uh, when I would spin out into spiritual spaces ecstatic experiences or the deeper warp and woof of the universe uh, I was often drawn into or, or had various visions or drawn into the experience of what's really taking place behind the scenes, and that is the this um, evolutionary crescendo that's building in time, this breaking forth of this deeper consciousness in history uh, that's breaking forward into time, and eventually in uh, in the 55th session out of a 73 session series. Uh, I had an extraordinary experience in which uh, I actually, what seems to have happened as best as I can understand it, is that at some collective level, I went through the death rebirth of our species. It, it was, I was in a state of consciousness, hard to describe, but I was at that time, I was literally billions of people simultaneously and every individual and all billions at the same time simultaneously were uh, beginning to go through uh, a life-death crisis that was literally global. It was just a profound a restructuring of life. Life was being broken down to the very core. It was, I think, it, in, there's a massive die-off that's that's 
coming down to us, which is simply the fallout of our our ecological foolishness. Mm-hmm. So this and, was a, just an existential <clears throat> death. It was a, a physical possibility as well. Yeah, this was an entire species brought to extinction, mm-hmm. brought to the very edge of extinction. This is, uh, yeah, this this was being taken into the very essence, the depth of this historical crisis, which seemed to be peaking somewhere in the 21st century. And this is an imminent kind of crisis. Mm. And it looked like in the center of this crisis, it looked like we would all die. It looks like this was this was it. This was the end of it. We would we were going to go extinct. And then when it was like being on an island with a hurricane coming over. In the end, everybody was forced to just hunkering down and holding on and hoping that they weren't being blown away. And it looked like death was inevitable. And then at the in the last minutes, suddenly the storm crested and passed. Mm. And there were survivors. And survivors began to find each other and began to reconstruct. But then what happened was the most extraordinary explosion of of new social structures, new forms that had ref- that reflected the birth of a new consciousness that was literally birthed by the pain of our near extinction event. Yes. And out of this trauma of a species brought to the very edge of extinction, there was a a tearing away of what is inessential mm. and, and a birth of what is essential. And I, this I think of the birth of soul consciousness, but not just a birth of soul consciousness, or put it this way, the nature of soul consciousness is to know the truth of our interconnectivity. It is to know the common ground that we all share. It is to know our place in the universe and our camaraderie with all other beings, not just human beings, but all other beings who share this planet. That sprang into an augmented capacity. It sprang into an empowered position so that when we began to reconstruct our lives, we weren't really reconstructing. We were creating a new culture. We were creating new social forms that were reflecting new realities that had been birthed in the throes of this crisis. This was a shattering and a a profound experience for me because it took me it took me several years really to absorb the experience because it's it's like it's like uh, being in uh, Hiroshima on uh, the week before the bomb goes off and knowing that Every human being that you see on the face of the planet is about to go through uh, a, a, a nightmare mm. of great suffering, mm-hmm. and then to ha- and to have so much so profound much profound respect for these beautiful beings who volunteered to undergo this crisis as part of our collective transformation. And then in years following, uh, as the work continued, and I continue to go into this, there were several episodes where I entered into deep time and spent time with what I call the future human. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just had the opportunity to be with this new archetype that's coming forward in history and it's only in the experience of the future being that humanity is becoming that we really begin to understand the larger evolutionary trajectory and what we are actually giving birth to. It's, it is as if we're going into labor, yes. but we, we didn't know we were pregnant. It's only in seeing the baby that we really understand the whole gestational process. 
So nature has been gestating this human being for a hundred thousand years. I mean, ever since sapiens emerged on the scene, we've been behind the scenes gestating the next mm -hmm. layer of our evolutionary story. Well, you're this, perfectly describing the prenatal perimatrix uh, outlined by Stan Groff, too, and mm -hmm. it's, but it's just on a collective level. It's on a collective level. Yeah. And this, the future human is, is such an extraordinarily beautiful being. I mean, it's just, when I focus my mind on it, even now, it brings me to tears because... Mm -hmm. It's it's a humanity healed of its divisive history. It's a humanity of all of its wounds resolved. It's a humanity with its with its heart completely open at a deep and profound level uh, uh, in collective embrace. It's a humanity with its mind open into deep communion with the transcendent. Uh, it's a, it's a humanity where war ends yeah. and and cooperation and collaboration is the norm it's a planet that has outgrown its its divisiveness mm -hmm. and has entered into a time of history of mm -hmm. collaboration not monolithic safe, sameness but tremendous creative collaboration where we begin to consciously cooperate with the divine rather than unconsciously cooperate with the divine. And this is what you've termed the diamond soul. The diamond soul, yeah. Yes. Uh, because is, our, our, yeah, this birth of this new human on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. I've also heard it termed homo luminous, which mm -hmm. sounds about the same. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this is not just our human evolution that this reverberates all through the beingness of the source that this is um, not just about us it's not just about us and whatever is happening on this planet i'm sure is mirrored in similar processes that are taking place in other planets and other solar systems and other mm -hmm. galaxies so that this gestational process is a natural process. It's simply an, an extension of evolution reaching a new critical point. Yes. And that and everything we're learning about uh, the evolution of our galaxies and, and the universe at large is that whatever is taking place here in one way or another is taking place in other corners of the universe. Yes. So we are we just – We extend our fields out Further and further and further, we start to get a, a feel for what you're saying. Yeah, we are cosmic citizens. We are not only global citizens, but we are cosmic citizens. And I'm sure there'll come a time when uh, higher orders of community, intergalactic communion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will emerge as part of the natural sequence. Whether, so of course, many people believe that's already begun. Yeah. And and maybe it has, but it, it's almost an, it's inevitable that it will be part of our future. So beautiful, Chris. So beautiful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And it'll speed up the more of us cooperate with that process. Yes, it's speeding. It speeds up the more we collaborate, the faster it moves for us individually and us collectively. That's the other thing that emerged uh, from that critical session I, I described, and that is an understanding of how we actually, we have a huge distance to travel as a species and a very short period of time to travel that distance. And there have been many people who have pondered, how can we possibly change as much as we have to change in order to survive in as little time as the ecological crisis seems to be giving us to change? And I think the key is understanding the collective dynamics that are at play. That it's it's not simply seven million seven billion individual minds that have to change. At core, it's this collective mind of the species 
which is undergoing a change. So right. if you take what we know about fields and fields theory and nonlinear systems and tipping points and catalytic points, and you make the assumption that the collective psyche is in some way a unified field, and that what we know about uh, nonlinear systems applies also to the collective psyche, then we can understand how we might actually make it the, as far as we need to travel as quickly as we need to make the traveling. And that is all the suffering and all of the confrontation with our divisive ways are not simply registering on in our individual psyches, but everything that the individual registers is fed into and registers at the collective level. And that when enough individuals come to a tipping point and, and begin to choose a different way of living uh, themselves individually, sooner or later the species comes into a tipping point. And at that point, hundredth monkey phenomena kind of thing, uh, the, the pace of evolution accelerates exponentially. The new common right. sense emerges. Um, it's like playing chess with Koyana Skatsi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And that's why programs such as yours is so important, because just because of the depth and breadth of the outreach, the number of, of uh, synapses of our collective brain that you're able to bring together. The new technology right. is just opening up an exponential increase of understanding. In your advanced sessions, I'm going to change back mm -hmm. to a question here. You experience various permutations of the divine in domains that lie beyond the story of humanity's evolution and beyond all form, but the yeah. two are intimately related. Would you share your experiences and insights with us regarding that? I mean, yeah. you, you have been all along, but uh, with a specific yeah. focus on... Yeah. You know, this is... Uh hard to do without sounding like a madman. <laughs> yeah, uh, well. <laughs> that's, the, that's the challenge of even trying to speak Oof. about psychedelic experiences because it's so, it expands exponentially the frame of a conversation that uh, unless you're willing to enter into that conversation, it, it's just, and since I live at a university, I know how easy it is for very intelligent, well-educated people to write off this entire conversation. Sure. But so if we let go of all of that and go into the possibility that one can open up to the mind of the universe, then the most extraordinary story begins to unfold. The invitation here, there's so many ways one could put it, I don't know. The invitation, the privilege is to experience the ways in which the universe is alive in depths that are hidden to simple physical consciousness, to enter into archetypal reality. And I don't mean that in a narrow Jungian sense, but to, to enter into the flows of intelligence, the flows of consciousness, the flows of life that actually are giving structure to and giving form to time space itself right. uh, to go outside of time and space to go enter back into time and space to, to to be drawn into in some way the intimate in an intimate way the very birthing of time and space as an ongoing event mm -hmm. to experience uh, the enormity of the intelligence of the universe. I mean, it's. I mean, we know what it's like when we're around very intelligent people. They're just different than people who aren't intelligent. And, and but to enter into orders of magnitude of intelligence that's actually behind the universe is a. It's a mind-shattering experience, and to be to to dissolve and to be for a time that kind of being to touch the edges of the garment of the divine is uh, it just it radically reframes 
you know, one's understanding of the life that one is part of. And then equal to the intelligence is the compassion, the love. It just, it shatters again and again uh, all frames of reference. The, the love that's behind the universe is as large as the intelligence that's manifesting in the universe. And, you know, this is, this planet is hard. Life is hard. It, it, there are so many, there's so much suffering, and it's such a difficult place to be that the very intensity of time space experience has been used to argue against the, the intelligence of the, that there is an intelligence and that there is a love, a compassion behind existence, but to actually experientially enter into communion with that intelligence and to feel that love and to begin to understand some of the ways in which once you open up to the true depth of the project of an emergent universe and the depths of the project of the divine, then you begin to understand the ways in which it, it, there really is compassion manifesting this suffering that we have been going through for so many hundreds of thousand years is just a phase. It's not an enduring condition. It's a phase that reflects the limitations of our species at our particular time in evolution. There is a, an ongoing fullness that is expressing itself. We will move beyond all this pain generation. We will move beyond all the, the hate and bigotry uh, of our divisive ego consciousness, and then, and then, and then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, then uh, and just there to be mo to go into experiences that Stan calls the super cosmic and metacosmic void. To go into the domain of the formless, the domain that is the great is this plenum. Yeah. Is this beyond even the creation and the evolution? Yeah, it's where creation and evolution comes from. Right. It's it's in it's transcending all time and all space, going into some kind of fundamental reality where form does not exist, none of the forms exist, and it is that reality which actually gives birth to all form. So it's 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 often described as the void, mm. but it's also the plenum, the divine plenum. The, it is the it's sometimes in Buddhism sometimes calls it the Buddha womb, the awakened womb, I, the cosmic womb. It's the mother universe. It's it's that which is gestating everything which is, because this physical universe, as vast as it is, as enormous as it is, and magnificent as it is. It is Time and space as we know it is not the only universe. There are other universes. So we have to get to a radically expanded cosmology. And all of these universes are manifesting out of a primal reality, which is formless in itself. The, the, the sheer, the majesty of the mother. She's so beautiful. Yes. She's Are you so familiar beautiful. With, uh, with Sri Aurobindo and the mother? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, what I think Sri described as his super consciousness. Yeah, I, Sri Aurobindo, I think, is one of the the great thinkers helping us make the pivot away from the old cosmology, the up and out cosmology, into an incarnational cosmology. Great, a great thinker. Well, I, earlier you had you, you had talked about you would recommend a, a less than high dose regimen. Uh, what would you recommend from your development state at this point to an earlier self? Yeah, if I were talking to my younger self, or if I'm talking uh, to my own children who are young adults now, yeah. uh, well. I would recommend it, it, it partly it depends upon what are you trying to accomplish. I when I got into this work, 
what I was seeking was enlightenment, you know, like what most of us were seeking uh, to be a better human being, to be a more awake, uh, conscious individual being. And what I found was if, if you want to seek classically what we mean by enlightenment, uh, to be able to become completely open to the depth of reality in the immediate moment in a way which uh, ego yields and what I call leaf consciousness yields to tree consciousness, to the, to the transparent life of the totality. I think it's actually better to work with low doses, to work, to, to go track down the ego where it lives. And the ego lives in close, it lives on the earth, and it, it, it needs to be tracked back to its lair. And really working, that means really working with lower doses and really taking it apart bit by bit, integrating that type of work with with meditation, various classical meditation practices. And I, I should mention all my life, I've also been a, you know, I'm a teacher of religious studies, so I've taught courses in world religions and Eastern religions and comparative right. mysticism all my life. So I've spent my entire life learning from the sages and have just deep abiding respect for the spiritual levels of spiritual realization achieved by the great masters of and men and women of all lineages. Right. And I've always tried to combine contemplative practice with shamanic practice. I've I became a Vajrayana practitioner fifteen years ago and I I've tried to integrate my Vajrayana practices with my shamanic psychedelic work and tried to put those together. But I found that over time that a lot was taking place in these sessions that were not serving the purpose of individual enlightenment at all. And I think that has to do really when you start working with high doses, you get involved in a different game. Here the game is collective enlightenment. And and the game is actually the, the game of exploring the universe. And I don't think you need to transcend time or take evolution back to the Big Bang or be absorbed in archetypal levels of reality in order to achieve enlightenment. That's right. it's just a it's a different enterprise. As a philosopher, I was drawn into the enterprise of knowing the universe. But if we, even if we focus on that enterprise, I would do it differently. And that is, of course, I would I would continue to always embed working with psychedelics into a daily spiritual practice. And my the rule of thumb is the deeper non-ordinary state you go into on a temporary basis, the more important it is to have a strong daily practice to anchor your temporary practice. Right. And so it's not an alternative. It has to be grounded in the regimen of spiritual life, which is moral living, social commitments, social relationships, and what you do every day when you get up. Right. But in working with non with psychedelics, I would alternate. I think I would work at more strong doses, but I think working, for example, if you're working with LSD, 300 micrograms is a lot easier than working at 500 or 600 micrograms, just to get specific. Yeah. And I, and I would alternate working with synthetic psychedelics like um, LSD with organic psychedelics. You know, we, we all know Terence McKenna was a great advocate of psilocybin and ayahuasca and DMT derivatives. And I would alternate. I would. I think psilocybin mushrooms, for example, really help the body absorb. It's very, it, to me, it's a very physical kind of experience. Yes. And if you're working with high dose LSD, interspacing those sessions with psilocybin sessions or ayahuasca sessions can really kind of help the body and the subtle energy systems absorb the uh, the deep visionary states you go into when you're working with LSD because I think of LSD as kind of a high altitude drug you know it <laughs> tends to in high doses it tends to blow you into cosmic territory a black diamond run <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, and 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 there are other 
the organic substances, and the two that come to mind particularly are psilocybin and, and ayahuasca, really kind of help the body and uh, ground these very deep states of consciousness more completely into the physical body, into the mental body, into the emotional body. So I guess I would do fewer high-dose LSD sessions, and I would work with, a, in, with an alternate regimen of organic psychedelics. Well, that does tend to uh, take the the commonplace away from it, if you were to alternate. You mm -hmm. know, I, I can see how time after time after time of doing a high dose without the intention that you've brought to it of of expanding rather than just playing could get tiresome if all you were doing was playing yeah yeah and to me it's been interesting how many people have felt that if you if you work with let's say lsd that eventually you keep going back to the same level and you just keep re-experiencing the same lessons and therefore you know you sort of as Houston Smith said, when you get the message, you hang up the phone. Right. <laughs> but I, that hasn't been my experience. My experience is if you're working in a very internal way, internalized way, as long as you were willing to throw another log on the fire, the universe will keep taking you through break point after break point after break point. And the reason I stopped, I mean, in 1999, I stopped – what I call my serious work, the very high dose work. And I stopped for a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons was um, it was producing too much wear and tear on my physical body and particularly my subtle energy body. I was literally running quantities of energy that were just larger quantities of energy than even I, I could handle, even using these archetypal Vajrayana deity practices in between sessions. Right. Uh, I, I just had to step away. I had to slow down and let my energy recalibrate and adjust to uh, what had been what had been realized in all these years of work. Mm -hmm. And the other reason I stopped was um, it. I couldn't. It was getting increasingly difficult to come back. Not not <laughs> psychological, but it was too painful. Yeah. To come back into time and space when one has gone into the the fields of diamond luminosity they are just they're so magnificent they're so beautiful and to be that intimate with the divine and then have to come back into you know the beautiful earth but the more limited circumstances of ordinary consciousness even if consciousness is being transformed that is the real drawback of what i call the path of temporary immersion it's a it the the methods that move you more slowly into these deep and profound spaces allow you to keep those terror to keep those spaces after your retreat is over but the Be path of temporary immersion plunges you ahead of yourself in a way right and so it's a temporary yeah it's just a visit rather than it's, a move it's a visit it yeah you know ramdas said it opens windows but it doesn't allow you to go out the door I, it's I understand that and it's true, but uh, it's a visit that changes the course of your evolution. When spirit told me one time uh, when I was backing away and <clears throat> said 20 years in, 20 years out. <laughs> so 20 years of work in don't ex you, you can't assimilate that without expecting to spend 20 active years of assimilation. And now I, I actually think it's even more than that. I, I think that when you work in very deep states of consciousness like this, it doesn't just affect you for the rest of your life. It affects you at a soul level so that I think it really would take many lifetimes to assimilate the full scale and scope of, uh, of what has unfolded in the work. So yeah. it changes your deep evolutionary trajectory. 
So the challenge at this point, I think, is now that we have these technologies that allow us to blow out the levels and, and to plunge deeply into these places of the universe, the challenge really shifts not from breaking out. The challenge shifts to integration. Yes. Yes. Deep, deep integration in your mind, in your heart, in your social relationships, in your body on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess that's why the Tao say before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> yes. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, fascinating. Chris, would you say that ultimately the unconditional love that you experienced on your uh, journeys is the lesson that we all need to learn? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> to me, love, <clears throat> unconditioned love, uh, unrestricted compassion is <clears throat> it is the correlate to oneness if the universe exists as a single entity if if God is ultimately the fabric of existence and if oneness is the great truth within which we live then oneness manifests in all sorts of ways but one of the ways it manifests is in this profound emotional ecstatic embrace of everything which is, of all life. You know, the shaman comes out of trance and cries, all my relations. You know, I am one with all my relations, with all the beings of the world. So love really is of the essence because oneness is of the essence. And love is the manifestation of oneness in the human heart. So that, that deep feeling of acceptance uh, of all beings and every human being, even human beings that are doing stupid, terrible, hurtful, injurious things to themselves and to each other, but to not close your heart down to them and to hold them in that embrace of oneness. Yeah, I think you're right. I think one love is, you know, the breathing of the universe as one. Thank you. Do you sense this experience and experiences others have that are similar? They co-create a meeting with the divine so we can all remember what we have forgotten? Yeah, I do. I really do. Uh, I think, you know, the, the classic story of reincarnation is when we die, we remember. And when we're born, we forget. You know, so when we die, you know, the near-death episode research shows us very clearly when people die or nearly die they experience a tremendous accelerated expansion of consciousness and a sense of remembering how could they have forgotten the spiritual world but then when we're born at least at this stage of our evolution we have a tendency to forget we contract into these time space suits um, the egoic identity so these all these technologies whether it's uh, trance dancing, or silence, or fasting, or meditation, or deep tissue uh, rolfing, or all these various methods for uh, loosening up the shell of our body-mind identity ultimately opens us into this more intimate dialogue with the universe in which over and over again we experience it as a remembering. So I think collectively, we are remembering who we are. We're remembering what the purpose of life is. We're remembering, you know, what the project is. And every time one of us remembers, it makes it easier for other people to remember. So that I think collectively, we are really trying to incarnate a field of remembrance which ultimately converts into, in a sense, a field of communion. Because when we remember that there is this reality, there there is a universe surrounding the physical universe, there is a mother universe, there is a spiritual reality. It's always there. It's, it's always tapping at the back of our consciousness. It's always sustaining our bodies and our hearts and our minds. Then remembrance yields to communion really deeper communion 
so that, I mean, as long as we believe that the universe was a dead universe, who would want to commune with a dead right. universe? But if it's right. a living universe, if it's saturated with intelligence and saturated with intentionality, then that's a universe I'd want to enter into communion with. So remembering becomes an ongoing process of entering into sustained communion where that which we are here and that which is the totality together we create something that's never been before really that's we're we're in the process of creating thoughts feelings visions social realities that have never existed on this planet before mm-hmm. yeah Thank you. Mm, thank you. Chris, this is Sabella again. So in all of the work that you did and the personal transformation you did, and then you were going back to the university and being in a very academic world, how did your personal transformation and practice impact how you were in in the you know quote unquote real world and and the other people hmm. you weren't a yeah. muggle anymore you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you only get promoted for your muggleness you know at the universities is a different order that's that's a complicated process and it wasn't entirely comfortable um and i <clears throat> i learned how to live in two worlds um i mean this work, uh, because of its legally problematic nature, uh, cannot be discussed openly in academic circles. It can be discussed in certain avant-garde circles. It can be discussed in Bay Area circles and in very progressive institutions. And I, I've taught courses on this type of work at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Department of Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. But here in Ohio, it's it's a much more conservative environment, and, and they have the right to be where they are. And so there were tensions between – but there were tensions that ultimately I found I could work with creatively. And as my consciousness changed, naturally who I was or what I was changed and that meant the experience of my teaching, the, what I taught changed. <clears throat> and so there are kind of two levels. One is content, and then so, there's a deeper level that has to do with the energetic being underneath the content. So content-wise, I was able to design courses where I was able to discuss s- some of these phenomena in a a certain way. So I've taught a course called Transpersonal Studies. So we studied reincarnation research and we studied near death episode research and we studied uh, out of body research. And I taught a course called Psychology of Religion, but it was really transpersonal psychology of religion. And there I traced the, the history of depth psychology and spent about a third of the course talking about Stan Gross work and psychedelic research never referencing myself, simply referencing the literature and Stan Gross's work. So, and I've taught seminars through the years in advanced transpersonal theory where I created academic context for students and I to have conversations about some of these realities. And my colleagues have always, you know, I've always had good relationships with my colleagues and they've known that I've been out on the far side left, but they've given me room to work there. And I found that if you have student numbers, if you have if you have students who want to take your courses, and if you're a good citizen of, of the university, you know, if you do your work and you support the department and you uh, you work on all the committees and you do all the things that's expected of you, then uh, you really have much more room to improvise and push the boundaries than might at first appear. So many people have asked me, how did you get away with teaching the courses you teach, you know, at this open enrollment state university? And I found that, you know, we really have much more freedom and flexibility if you're willing to seize it 
than um, we might initially think. And there are other people who are pushing those boundaries. Tom Roberts at, uh, in Illinois at a state university has been teaching about psychedelics in his classes for years. And there's in an academic context where you pay your academic dues to that discussion. But there's there was a deeper process going on, and that is the deeper my experience became of this universe, it changed how my mind works, it changed how my psyche works, and it changed my energy in a way so that when I was coming into the classroom and simply teaching things that were not about any of these things, I was teaching intro world religions or introduction to Eastern religions or something like this, it began, to, I found that uh, at a subtle psychological level, at a collective level, things began to happen between myself and my students that uh, were somewhat unusual. For example, I found that when I would just be reaching for an example, just to make a point, to make a theoretical point, I would reach for an example and I'd create an example out of my imagination. And then after class one day, a student came up to me and when he was sure that there was no one around who could hear what he was about to say, the room was empty. He said, you know, it's strange that you use that example in class today because that's exactly what happened to me last week. And I found that that happened, began to happen repeatedly through the years. And students were finding bits and pieces of their life showing up in my lectures very in very precise and exact ways without my intending it, without my even being consciously aware when it was happening. And not only were they finding pieces of their life showing up in my lectures, but often it was the parts that were showing up were touching them in very, very deep and personal ways. It was as if their soul was whispering to my soul, which is passing it up into my conscious awareness, pieces of information that they needed to heal themselves, that they needed to take the next step in their own evolutionary journey. So during these years when I was doing this work, I became kind of a lightning rod of the soul for many of my students. And this became so pronounced that I had to actively, consciously engage this process and understand it more deeply and to work with it so that I would, um, so that it wouldn't become too intense for my students, so that it would, it would um, stay within the bounds of what's appropriate in a classroom. Um, and that's the story that I tell in the living classroom. I tell the story of that dance that unfolded between my students and me. And then I began to understand that it was more than just resonance between my students and me. There was uh, a resonance that was being created by the field of our coming together, that there was uh, the field of a group focused in intense study actually has an animating effect on the individual minds that are present there in a way which activates these collective, these are morphic fields for groups and uh, my students, you know, if the faculty had reservations about what I was doing or what was happening, my students never did. The students were always there. They were much more forward thinking, I think, than the faculty. They always met me well. And we just had just wonderful adventures in the classroom. And at the same time, um, I could not bring everything that I knew to be true into my undergraduate classroom. It just wasn't fair, it wasn't appropriate. And so I had to hold back a lot. And in the later years of my career, and I've retired now, that holding back became um, difficult for me because I, I, I could feel a tension, that uh, literally a catch that would happen in my throat when my instinct was always to share more information than my circumstance allowed me to share. And I would sometimes uh, lose control of my voice for short seconds at a time. It was kind of like a bark. And so it was a tension between 
the forces that were holding me in check and the forces that wanted to express itself. And this is basically, uh, you know, I went through, I was a, a professor for 33 years and I've stopped that. Uh, and I love being in the classroom. I love being with the students. But I've stopped that in order to write books that I could not, I did not feel that I could write while I was working as an academic, uh, books that are more uh, openly embracing the hidden side of my life, the psychedelic side of my life, which I hope will put me in conversations with uh, a different group of, of adults, more spiritually informed, more uh, progressed in their own spiritual evolution, for two years, I worked as the director of education for the, a nonprofit, uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where I had many opportunities to speak with and engage and do workshops with people uh, like yourselves, people who have been consciously living the spiritual life and engaging these issues or are not afraid of these issues or plunging into them, these transformative processes. And I, I hope to be doing more of that work in the last phase of my life. So I've kind of entered from an astrological perspective, uh, the third turning of the wheel of Saturn, my the second Saturn cycle from when I was 29 to 58, 60 was my academic career. And now I've entered the third cycle, which I think is really more exclusively focused on uh, this, these deep transformative practices and the insights that emerge from them. Yeah, it sounds like your experience with your students was really beautiful. And I, th um, mm -hmm. I, I think it was. I think they were, we were all, we all were touched and we all learned many things from them. In fact, the last third of the living classroom is all essays written by my students. Uh, what oh, would happen, wow. I have my students do a lot of writing and most of their writing is intellectual academic kind of writing and but every once in a while, a student would take the chance of, and write a more personal essay. So they would share the deepest, most profound experience they had ever had. They would share stories of their father's death or their own conversion experience or their own experience of nearly dying. And I began to collect these through the years. I would ask them if I would, could, if, could keep a copy of this to use sometime in the future. And I, I collected a beautiful folder, of these magnificent stories of transformation. And when I wrote The Living Classroom, I knew that this was the time to give these back. So the whole last third of the book, it's really a second book, uh, is really students, it's sharing these students' stories with the public because they, they're just so beautiful. Uh, so I think it I think it was a very positive experience for all of us. I, I know I learned a lot from it. Yeah, it sounds like it's the stretching dance of of straddling two worlds in that way. And then, you know, I think we've all experienced where you might know something, but the person you're talking to is not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting to have this free reign to talk mm -hmm. about things and just let people be drawn to it or not yeah it's, yeah. it's really lovely yeah and again i i think the the undergraduate the students were much more receptive than the faculty i you believe know? that yeah you know they're just they're just they are a different generation they are already you know they have this in their bones they are a different generation of souls yeah. but chris don't you think that those that are doing this work enable the newer, the younger generations to come in already knowing a lot of this stuff because the work's being done. I, th I hope so. I mean, I th we all have different roles in this uh, in this evolutionary saga, and you know, if, if there is a seventh generation, as the Hopi prophecies predicted, and or the Indigo generation. I am, and maybe some of you are part of the sixth generation, you know, and our mm -hmm. job is to hold, to break ground for these young people and to hold, to create the container that allows them to come to a speedier fruition of their own capacities, of their own consciousness yes. on the planet. And I, I hope that what we're doing 
creates an, in a very tangible social structure, but also a subtler psychic structure mm. way, creates fields that empower them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it is a collective consciousness. And it what is. what we learn or discover affects them especially because they're more open to it. They don't have the letting go to do like us old dinosaurs. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's it's a complex feedback cycle. I, I give an, an example. Uh, I I often had the experience where I would read a book and it would contain a aha experience for me and it would give me insight into something that uh, I hadn't understood before. Or I would have a particular experience in a psychedelic session where something new would open. I would understand something that I hadn't understood before. And within a week, a student would ask me a question and I would have an answer which two weeks previous I wouldn't have had an answer for that would helpful to them. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't it wonderful how the universe uses one person's learning to facilitate the learning of other people? <laughs> and, and then over time I began to realize, wait a minute, I'm only seeing one half of the circle. I have the, the cart before the horse. I began to understand that the student's need to know the question that was coming toward me, the student who was coming to me, was actually influencing my own field and causing me to read some of the books that I was reading and even have some of the experiences that I would ha was having in order to have something available to them when they came and actually asked the question. So, it, so it's not simply that I'm doing this work and the universe is taking advantage of distributing this information. But the the cycle, it's a circle between st students and teachers, and I, I mean that in a broader sense, mm -hmm. that their need to know was actually seeding my need, my capacity to understand, so ah. that it's a circle. And I wouldn't be reading or thinking what I'm thinking if it weren't for the seeding of these students coming to me. So at that point, you truly open up to the mystery oh. and majesty of the universe and just bow in prayer to the grandeur of what's coming forward. We are all in it together. Oh, I love this. This yeah. is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So what are your thoughts on the legal use of psychedelics and therapy and healing and um, what's going on right now with using psychedelics as tools, philosophically, mm -hmm. cosmologically, you know, making inquiry. What mm -hmm. do you think is the future of that? Well, I think we're tilting back in the right direction. Um, I'm sure uh, many of your listeners are aware of MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is a an educational and lobbying organization which is trying to change our laws around psychedelics and is, is successfully moving psychedelics back into the area of respectable research, um, supporting research with psychedelics, bringing it back into the therapeutic arena. Uh, I think we are the this class of chemicals is so important that I don't think we're going to lose them forever. The, you know, we're going to step away from these very repressive policies of the late 60s and, and 70s so that we are going to reappropriate with this new wave of, of scholars and researchers these substances for their therapeutic potential. Sooner or later, as we do that, we will, and I think this is also happening with, as we open to uh, ayahuasca, the ayahuasca circles, the indigenous shamanic populations, which have been using psychedelics, not only to heal psychologically, but to, uh, to engage the universe spiritually and philosophically. I think as we reappropriate these substances for their clinical therapeutic value, we are also in the process of reappropriating them for their philosophical illuminating value. I just don't see how we can uh, keep pushing these things away from us. Uh, the world which reveals itself 
through psychedelics is profoundly compatible with the world that we are studying, that we are learning through science. And it's, it's particularly compatible with quantum theory and field theory and, and all the sciences which have been given birth in the post-Newtonian era. In the Newtonian world, which is still the academic gospel of, of the universities, the, the universe is a clockwork and it's a, it's a purposeless machine which moves by chance and necessity and, and mathematical precision. But in the quantum world where we pivoted in the 1930s, we're in a very, very different universe where intentionality saturates uh, the world, where uh, there is a simultaneity of fields of knowledge underlying discrete existence. This is very much very compatible with the world that psychedelics are showing us, so that as the intellectual community really internalizes and absorbs what is truly the cutting edge of science, it's less, uh, it's more open to the type of experiences that are that emerge spontaneously in working with psychedelics. So I think that there is a shift taking place. Uh, at a very deep cognitive level among leading thinkers, which is going to open more and more doorways to psychedelics in the future. And uh, I think we can look forward to a time in the future when you will be able to work with psychedelics if you choose to have a, a therapeutic, if you choose to incorporate psychedelics into your therapeutic regimen, you'll be able to do so. If you choose to incorporate psychedelics into your spiritual regimen, you'll be able to do so. Uh, there have been a couple of communities in the United States, ayahuasca communities, who have taken their case all the way to the Supreme Court and have won the right to use ayahuasca as part of their spiritual practice. So we already are opening up the legal doors. So I see it moving in a very positive in a very exciting direction. Mm -hmm. To me, psychedelics are one of the just, as a philosopher, I cannot overemphasize how important they are to opening, to, to uh, facilitating this intellectual paradigm that's, that's taking place because classically, historically, it took decades, decades of spiritual practice before one could have access to these transpersonal dimensions of existence. But psychedelics can give even a modest individual short-term exposure to the deeper, these deeper textures of reality, and they allow you to change your thinking. Even if you can't abide in those realities, they allow you to change your understanding of the world we live in so that they're tremendous door openers. And I think that uh, we won't be able to turn down uh, the invitations that they are extending into us and that they will be very much part of this uh, vast cultural awakening taking place. Yeah. Yes, it seems like the, the paradigm we live in, you know, the Newtonian physics the mechanical clockworkness of it, and people have lost the ability to find new questions. Mm -hmm. You know, and it sounds like psychedelics. It gives the chance, the the fish, the chance to observe the water, and then you have whole new possibilities of questions. Yes, yes, and absolutely, and new questions, uh, new opportunities. Uh, and it, it may take you, once the doors are open, you, it may take you not necessarily to continued psychedelic experience, but it may take you to more traditional spiritual practices of meditation, yoga, whatever. But it's a tremendous door opener. Yeah. 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 Thank I think you. You know, if you live in the Newtonian universe, I have witnessed for decades what a terrible, terrible damaging gospel secular humanism is for our students. I mean, the vision is that existence is an accident. It's a fluke. It proceeds by chance. There is no deeper intentionality behind your life. If you live in a beautiful, healthy body, 
you're lucky if you live in a in a body plagued by illness you're just not so lucky the universe isn't conscious it isn't paying attention to you i mean how could how could that you know, that vision of reality not breed all sorts of various types of personal and social pathology and if the universe is essentially dead and if we are essentially just material beings then materialism makes sense we just try to have as many experiences and as consume as many material things as we can before we die because when we die we're going to cease to exist anyway so who cares and that is the gospel which we've been giving our our brightest most creative minds for generations and now that's beginning to shift now with the emergence of an understanding of the, the way in which the universe is actually alive we can document its livingness in our laboratories and we can have facilitated experiential immersion in that aliveness then that opens up a, a, a profoundly expanded vision of ourselves and it, it gives us a kind of leverage to take us away from this blind consumerism so that we can begin to draw our resources from a deeper uh, immersion in the universal in the universe itself so for people who have a crisis of of lack of meaning in in the world mm -hmm. this could be a really beneficial avenue I think it can be very beneficial. I think just reading, of course, is enormously beneficial. I mean, I do a workshop sometimes called uh, No Fear of Death. And here my contention is if you read uh, uh, the right dozen books, it should completely dissolve any fear of death. It should open up the possibilities of really understanding the uh, in a new way what the meaning of life is, what the possibilities are, the potentials are. If you look at reincarnation research, near-death episode research, pa uh, if you look at um, life between life therapy of, of Michael Newton and where we're regressing people back not only to their former life memories but to their awareness of their life between their incarnations, if you combine that with research <coughs> in psychedelics, I mean, this this just creates an intellectual context that opens up all new sorts of avenues for understanding the meaning of life and the purpose of life. That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, before we bring this symposium to a close, I'd like to read something you wrote in Dark Night, Early Dawn. Okay. And you, and you said, I believe that this divine marriage of individuality – an essential ground of the masculine and feminine, of samsara and nirvana, is the dawn that humanity's dark night is driving toward. This is the dawn that, if successfully navigated, will unite humankind and elevate us into a form that has never before walked this earth, a humanity healed of the scars of history its ancient partitions reabsorbed, a people with new capacities born in the chaos of near extinction. Only when we have made this pivot, when our long labor has birthed this future child, only then will we fully understand what we have accomplished. And when this moment finally comes, I deeply believe that, like all mothers before us, we will count our pain as a small price. This birth is our gift to the Creator. Thank you for writing this. Thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. We so appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been an honor and a privilege to spend this time with you. Thank you. Can I just read a poem? I, I may Please have read do. it before, mm. but mm. I, I have. Motion as love's beauty is moving. Standing nakedly and blushing in photonics, brightly rushing as love's artistries unbrushed. Time in silent rhythms crushing, sped slowly long and in a hush. To bring to riptidal lushness out as and of coupling within flux.
Namaste. Mm, it's beautiful. Thank you. Chris, could you tell us uh, the names of your books and maybe just a brief synopsis about them? Uh, the books are, the first one is called Life Cycles, Reincarnation and the Web of Life. Uh, it's basically a book on reincarnation. It looks at reincarnation through uh, at the issue of the empirical evidence. It looks at it as a psychological and spiritual phenomenon. And then it once it documents the empirical evidence for reincarnation, it then asks the question, so what? What's the difference if we see ourselves as reincarnating beings versus one-time through beings? So it's just one of the early attempts to explore this, the universe as a pulsing, throbbing, uh, reincarnating universe. Uh, the mm -hmm. second one is Dark Night, Early Dawn, which is a book in um, – the philosophical study of non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, specifically psychedelic states of consciousness, but integrating uh, psychedelic studies with near-death episode research and out-of-body research, trying asking the question: Is the is the universe as it shows itself in near-death episode research, in out-of-body research, particularly Robert Monroe's work at the Monroe Institute, and psychedelic research? Are those pictures cohering or are they mm. fragmenting? And uh, so exploring that and exploring the the ways in which our the collective psyche shows up in the work of individuals and the way the individual's work influences and contributes to our collective evolution, that integrated part. Yeah. And the, the third book is called The Living Classroom. And all of these are, you, you can get them on Amazon or other book sites. The Living Classroom tells the story of, uh, it's about fields of consciousness, uh, collective consciousness, the subtler background textures of consciousness as they surface in the classroom. Because what I found over time was, while I, I kept my personal life, my, quote, personal spiritual practice out of the classroom, because it's not appropriate to bring it into the classroom, that was my weekend work. What I found was that the work I was doing in these very deep states of consciousness outside of the classroom began to impact my students in the classroom. And I began to understand and, and to, had to think about and theorize about the collective, the, the nature of collective consciousness, not at, at the species level, but actually at a very intimate level of the students that I was working with week in, week out, year after year. So it's about you know, teaching and collective consciousness. So those are the three, and now I'm going back to the topic of, of uh, psychedelic work and trying to give some type of philosophical description or exploration of that 20-year psychedelic uh, odyssey that I went on between 1979 and 1999. 